This week, we're going through the history books. We're going through the most notorious criminal case in the 20th century. And then we're going to look at a twist that came 100 years later. We're going to be going back and forth across the Atlantic. But if it's putting you off because this case is so old, don't let it. Because this case is just staggering. It's been requested by Angie Wilson. And I'm telling you, it is just as good as any recent case. Ole Harvey Crippen was born in 1862 in Coldwater, Michigan, USA. That is the place he was born. He weren't born in some cold water in Michigan. It's a place in Michigan called Coldwater. He was the only surviving child to his parents. He first studied at the University of Michigan Homeopathic Medical School, and then he graduated from Cleveland Homeopathic Medical College in 1884. After just five years of marriage, his first wife, Charlotte, died of a stroke in 1892. This left Crippen and his young son on their own. So Crippen entrusted his parents, who lived in San Jose, California, with the care of his three-year-old son, and he went off to New York to start practicing homeopathic medicine. If you don't know what homeopathy is, it's basically a complementary or alternative medicine. While in New York in 1894, he went on to marry his second wife, Corrine Turner. A nickname for short sure was Cora, and a stage name, because she was a singer, was Belle Elmore. Interestingly, Dr. Crippen has been described as meek, gentle, and diminutive. However, Cora, on the other hand, was described as intimidating and extravagant. Her father was Polish-Russian, and her mom was German. And if you're thinking, that name doesn't really fit any of the above countries, well, that's because that's not actually a birth name. A birth name was a name that I can't pronounce, I do apologise, but it's this. Kunigunde Makamotsky. It's also said during their marriage, she openly had affairs. Also in 1894, Dr. Crippen started working for Dr. Munyon's homeopathic pharmaceutical company. Three years later, in 1897, the married couple moved to England. However, this was a bit of a setback because Dr. Crippen's US medical qualifications weren't really that well received in the UK. They weren't sufficient for him to practice as a doctor but he did continue working as a distributor of patent medicines. And meanwhile, as he did this, Cora was socialising with numerous other performers, including Lil Hawthorne, as well as her husband, John Nash. I point them to her mainly because they are important to the story later on. Another two years down the line, Dr. Crippen is now spending a lot of time managing and helping Cora with a staging career. So much so that this went noticed, and it's the reason he got fired from Dr. Munyon's in 1899. Dr. Crippen then went on to become a manager of Druitt's Institution of the Deaf. While working at this institution, he hired a young typist called Ethel Lenerve. She was hired to become his secretary, but over the next five years, leading up to 1905, the couple started having an affair. By couple, obviously, I mean Dr. Crippen and Ethel. So now you get where this is going. We're already seeing a marriage for isn't quite going very well, she's having affairs, he's having affairs, they're in a different country, the, 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 the pot's starting to boil. It's now 1905, it's been eight years since Mr. Crippen and Cora came to the UK. Ever since then, they've lived at various addresses in and around London, and now in 1905, they moved to 39 Hilldrop Crescent. This is in Holloway, London, which that's not there anymore, there should be a picture up about now, but that has been demolished at some point. A lot of people believe that the reason they moved to this address was because it was a bigger address and they needed extra space because they were having separate bedrooms. Now, I also read that Cora was apparently not a very sexual person. Take from that what you will. Like I said, she was openly having affairs and whatever else, but apparently she's not very sexual. And Dr. Crippen later said it was in 1907 that they stopped having a physical relationship completely. However, at this time, Dr. Crippen's income isn't all that good. Let's not forget he can't use his qualifications in England, he's just been fired, he's not doing all that well in his career because of all these setbacks, so he's not bringing him the money, and because of that, they need help to pay the bills. So, they've got a big enough house, they invite some lodgers. Now, in a relationship that's already full of affairs and stuff, maybe that were a bad choice. Cora started to have an affair with one of his lodgers, and in turn, Dr. Crippen decided, you know what, fine, if I'm not getting sex off you anymore, I'm going to go to Ethel 
and make her my mistress. And that's what he did in 1908. He said that like another year on in roughly December 1909, that Cora went to Dr. Crippen and said, look, I'm leaving you and I will be taking the savings with me. With that being said, that is all the backstory done. So if you're still with me, I'm very grateful. Um, let's get on with the case. It was only a month after, on the 31st of January, 1910, that they had this house party at Hilldrop Crescent. When I say house party, it was actually a dinner party, and there were only two other guests invited. These two guests were good close friends of Cora's. Now, for the most part, all went well. The guests left at around 1am on Monday the 1st of February, and everything had been alright. There was a little bit of a dispute when one of the guests wanted to go to the toilet, it was a male, and Cora got face on because... Uh, Dr. Crippen hadn't got up and escorted him to the toilet to show him where it were. She, she weren't very happy about that. But all in all, everything went well. But when they were leaving at 1am, nobody realised that that was going to be the last time anybody saw Cora. Nobody saw Cora after that time. It seems that immediately after that party, she disappeared. Dr. Crippen claimed that, look, she's fine, she's gone back to the United States, I don't know what she's doing things aren't too good, I'm sure it'll sort itself out. And then not too long after, he starts telling people that, look, she's died. She's been cremated in California. Meanwhile, while he's going around telling people all this, his mistress, Ethel, Ethel Leneuve, is now moving into Hilldrop Crescent, but even worse, she's openly wearing Cora's clothes and her jewellery. The police did hear of Cora's disappearance. It was from a friend of Cora's called Katie Williams. Now, Kate Williams is another star. She was a strong woman, and her stage name was Vulcana. Vulcana, I think, I'm sure it's Vulcana, because there's no R. However, the police didn't do that much. They didn't take it all that serious. But remember when I told you about Lil Hawthorne and John Nash, good friends of Cora's? Well, they was also good friends with Frank Frost. He was the superintendent at Scotland Yard. So they went and had a word with him, and that's when the case really started to get looked into by the police. The house at Hilldrop Crescent was searched, but nothing was found. And then Dr. Crippen was interviewed by Chief Inspector Walter Dew. During this interview, Dr. Crippen says, look, I fabricated the story. You've got me. She ain't really dead, but she's left me and she's fled to America. She's left with this actor, this guy. He's called Bruce Miller. This entire thing's really embarrassing. And that's why I made it up. I, I really don't want to be embarrassed and tell people. So that's what's going on. Now, Walter Dew listened to this and he's like, well, that does kind of make sense. And he was fully satisfied with the story, having had the search of the house and everything come back clear. So he says, mm, yeah, all right. But he didn't actually say, yeah, all right. He didn't actually tell Dr. Crippen what he was thinking. He just let the interview finish and he went on his way. And because he didn't verbalize this, Dr. Crippen comes out and he's like, oh my God, I'm so panicked. We've got to do something. So together with Ethel, they fled the country. They fled England and went to Brussels. Why they went to Brussels, I have no idea, but they did. They spent the night in a hotel, and the next day they boarded the Canadian Pacific liner SS Montrose, which were obviously bound for Canada. But unbeknown to them, this Chief Inspector Dew, who were quite happy with the story, went round to the house. Noticed that they weren't there, there was something quite not right, and obviously he's quite surprised at why they'd gone. So he decides, you know what, sod it, we're going to search the house again. In total, the house was searched four times. The first time weren't very thorough at all. It was just a quick search. And as they went on, the searchers got more and more thorough. That thorough, in fact, the fourth time, in the basement, they had a brick floor. This brick floor had been dug up, and underneath, they found a human torso. Now, bearing in mind, the only thing that's there is the torso, part of the body. Nothing else was there. A scientific analyst for the home office looked at his torso and found traces of scopolamine. Now, hold up. I could just say that's a drug vis-a-vis -vis effects, but what I did is I typed that into Google and it came up that there was a nickname for this thing called Devil's Breath. I mean, if I was a drug, that is literally the nickname that I would want. So I kept looking and this thing has just blown my mind. First of all, this, this copolamine comes out of plants. There's about five or six different types of plants that this comes out of. But one of them is mandrake. 
Do you know the screeching little plant that they have in Harry Potter? Yes, Mandrake. Now, I'm not actually nerdy as I sound right now, but there is a real plant called Mandrake. Who knew that? Now, for anyone interested, I will, I suggest you look it up. I'm not going to link it because there's links everywhere. But seriously, scopolamine, I'll put it on the screen now so you can see how it's spelled. It is, it is like something out of Harry Potter. It is a strange, strange drug. Now, it can be used for a load of things medicinally. It's to prevent sickness and amnesia and stuff, or create amnesia, whatever. It's used for a load of different things. But the important thing here is it can render a victim unconscious for 24 hours, and in a large dosage, it can cause respiratory failure and death. So the fact that they've found traces of this highly suggests that she's been poisoned, because it was in a large quantity too. So back to 1910. The remains were identified as Cora's. This were by a piece of skin found on the abdomen. The head, the limbs and the skeleton were never recovered. But the remains that were recovered were interred at the St Pancras and Islington Cemetery. At this time, Dr Crippen and Ethel are crossing the Atlantic. And Ethel is dressed as a boy. Their disguise idea was to be father and son. The captain, who was Henry George Kendall, recognised them to be fugitives, so he had the telegraphist send a telegram back to the British authorities. That telegram read, Have strong suspicion that Crippen, London, Seller, Murderer and Accomplice are among saloon passengers. Moustache taken off, growing beard. Accomplice dressed as boy, manner and build, undoubtedly a girl. Notice that they're travelling as saloon passengers. This basically means they're travelling in first class. And had they travelled in any other way, any other class, it's likely that they'd have never even been recognised. Having received the telegram, Chief Inspector Walter Dew was fast to board a faster White Star liner. That was the SS Laurentic. It set off from Liverpool and it arrived in Quebec, Canada. But more importantly, it arrived before the Montrose did. So as the Montrose entered the St. Lawrence River in North America, Walter Dew came on board dressed as a pilot. At this point, it's important to note that Canada is still a dominion within the British Empire. And that makes a big difference, because let's not forget, Crippen is a US citizen. So if it had gone to the US, or if it had got to the US, it would have taken extradition proceeds to get him out of the US back to the UK. But he hadn't, he'd gone to Canada. So with the Chief Inspector now on board, Captain Kendall then invited Crippen to meet the pilots as they came on board. At this point, it seems very smooth. Chief Inspector Dew removed his cap and says, Good morning, Dr. Crippen. Do you know me? I'm Chief Inspector Dew from Scotland Yard. After a pause, Crippen replied, Thank God it's over. The suspense has been too great. I couldn't stand it any longer. He then held out his wrist to be handcuffed. At that point, on the 31st of July, 1910, on board the Montrose, Dr. Crippen and Ethel Lenerve was arrested. They then returned back to the UK on the SS Megantic. Crippen was then tried at the Old Bailey on the 18th of October, 1910. The proceedings lasted for just four days. The first prosecution witnesses were pathologists. One of them was Bernard Spilsbury. He testified that he couldn't identify the torso to the extent he couldn't even identify if it was male or female. However, he did say that he'd found a piece of skin and this piece of skin had a scar on it. It was an abdomen scar and that matched Cora's medical history. Large quantities of the toxic substance Devil's Breath were found on the remains. And it was shown that Dr. Crippen had bought that drug from a local chemist not too long before the time. But Crippen's defence stayed consistent. They said no, Cora's fled to America with Bruce Miller, the actor. And look, Dr. Crippen and Cora had only been living in the house since 1905. Which suggests that the previous owner of the house must have been responsible for whose ever remains they are. The defence also pointed at this scar tissue that they were saying is chorus. They claim that this isn't scar tissue, it's just a folded piece of normal body tissue. They said a few things, but the biggest and most compelling one was the hair follicles were growing all along this scar tissue, or apparent scar tissue. And that doesn't happen with scar tissue, so it can't possibly be the scar tissue that they're saying it is. Billsbury argued against this and said no, the hair follicles aren't all the way along it, they're just at the ends. The prosecution did have more evidence though. They had a piece of pyjama top. Now, this piece of pyjama top was apparently found with the body. But most importantly, it matched the pyjamas that Cora had bought Dr. Crippen the year before. 
The pyjama bottoms had been found in his bedroom, but the top was nowhere to be found. Interestingly, the fragment that was found also included the manufacturer's label. So they got a representative from a manufacturer to testify that these pyjamas were only sold after 1908. So whoever had buried this body or the buried this torso under this basement had to have done it after 1908, which is after they moved into the house. And it was 1909 that Cora had given Dr. Crippen these pyjamas. With the body was also some curlers with bleached hair, which was consistent with Cora's. It said throughout the entire proceedings, Dr. Crippen showed no remorse for Cora, his wife. He only showed concern for Ethel, his lover's reputation. After just 27 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Dr. Crippen guilty. Ethel Lenerve, his lover, was only charged with being accessory after the murder, and she was later acquitted. Dr. Crippen never gave a reason for killing Cora, but as you can imagine, there is many theories that have arisen over the last 100 years. One theory was Dr. Crippen was giving Cora this devil's breath as an aphrodisiac or a depressant, and he did in fact accidentally get a too much and overdosed her. Then in 1981, Bearing in mind this is 70 years after a body's found and 70 years after a prosecution, a British newspaper, quite a few by the sounds of it, reported Sir Hugh Rye's ranking claimed to have met Ethel the Nerve. That were in 1930 in Australia, and she told him that Crippen murdered his wife because she had syphilis. But no matter what theories we bring up, the truth will never come out. Because at 9am on Wednesday, the 23rd of November, 1910, Dr. Crippen was hanged at Pentol Prison in London. Obviously, if he hadn't been hanged, he'd still be dead by now. He'd be like 150 year old. Ethel returned to the United States. And then she was settled in Canada and got work as a typist. She later returned to Britain in 1915 and she died in 1967 at the age of 84. At Dr. Crippen's request, a photograph of Ethel and Nerve was placed in his coffin and buried with him. He was buried in an unmarked grave. Now, before we get to the twist, there's a little bit more information. Dawn Fudge Yates was a junior barrister at the trial, and in his memoirs, he wrote that although Crippen placed the torso in quicklime to get destroyed faster, he didn't realise that when it became wet, it turned into slacklime. And that's not going to get it destroyed, it's actually a preservative. One theory is that this wasn't actually Cora's body. They reckoned that Crippen were doing illegal abortions, and this torso was a patient of somebody where the operation had gone wrong. So it was ready for the twist. Right, the, this is craziness. Um, but let's face it, at this point, everything is pretty much stacked against Dr. Crippen. The, as much evidence as you can possibly imagine from 1910. And obviously they didn't really have any DNA evidence back then. No DNA testing facilities, especially not for criminal courts. But in October 2007, we had lots of DNA capabilities. It was 97 years after a party in which Cora disappeared. And this is the time that Michigan State University forensic scientist David Foran claimed that the DNA evidence showed that the forensics found beneath Crippen's cellar were not those of his wife, Cora Crippen. Not only that, but they believed that that DNA shows that the torso actually belonged to a man, not a woman. Oh, and do you know how they were talking about that scar? And the defense said, that's not scar tissue. And the prosecution said, yeah, it is. Well, this scientist also said, no, it's not scar tissue because the air follicles are consistent throughout. All this research was published in August 2010 in an issue of Journal of Forensic Science. However, as with all new evidence, it has been disputed by a journalist. In the Times, David Aronovich wrote, as to the body being male, well, the American team was using a special technique that is very new and done only by this team. And working on a single century old slide described by the team leader as less than optimal sample. But David Foran did respond to this and he said the test showed unequivocally that the remains were male. The traces of blonde hair that were found under the floor with the body are now preserved in the Metropolitan Police Crime Museum. Interestingly, another researcher said They've asked, requested for samples from them for DNA testing, but the requests have always been denied. Saying that New Scotland Yard does say that they're willing to test the hair for them, but it'll incur a special fee. 
And these investigators say, well, no, that's just over the top. And I don't know if it's just from that, but researchers are speculating and hypothesizing that the pajama parts that was round the body were actually planted there just to incriminate Crippen, saying that, that Scotland Yard were under so much pressure by the public that they had to find somebody and put them to trial as quick as possible. And someone else was pointing out that this case didn't even become public until after the remains had been found. Which is strange. If you're looking for somebody that's missing, usually one of the first steps is to make it public. Especially if you think that they're in danger. One last thing before we end this. John Treachel, a toxicologist, has pointed out that this body was mutilated. The bodies weren't all together. His limbs and everything were in a different place to the torso. But among the poisoners, that's a very strange thing to happen. It's really not common. And I mean, that makes sense. If you're going to go through the effort of poisoning someone, why would you then go through the effort of mutilating them? In his words, he said, A poisoner wants the death to appear natural so they can get a death certificate. This is the only case I know of where the victim was dismembered. It doesn't make sense. In December 2009, the UK's Criminal Case Review Commission, having reviewed the case, declared that the Court of Appeal will not hear a case to pardon Crippen. There you go. Sorry, I know it's a very different case, um, but I'm very busy this week, so I tried to get one out. And Angie requested it. I were going to do it as a Wednesday video, an extra video, but I just haven't got time. So there you go. Next week, we will be back into the 21st century, I promise. Until then, don't forget, keep safe.